Hi folks, and welcome to Philosophy According to Eddie. In the second part of the Nature of God videos, uh, we're going to be looking at eternity and free will. We've already looked at omniscience, omnipotence and benevolence. But eternity and free will are properties of God uh, that are quite problematic in terms of balancing up the other three aspects. Eternity and free will have been challenged uh, or supported by Aquinas, Calvin, Boethius, Anselm, Swinburne and Plantinga. Before we start, it's worth drawing a distinction between eternity and sempereternity. Eternity is the idea that God is outside time. Sempereternity is the idea that God is within time, but everlasting. Now, Aristotle believed in sempereternity. Uh, the prime mover was within time, but everlasting. Whereas the traditional Christian idea is that God is outside the, uh, the realms of space and time. Free will, uh, we do also have to remember, links into the ideas of predestination. If we are predestined to go to heaven or hell, we do not have free will. Now, John Calvin believed in predestination and believed we did not have free will at all. St. Augustine um, also had this belief, but not quite as extreme as John Calvin. However, Aquinas, Boethius, Anselm, Swinburne and Plantinga all believe that we have a degree of free will. We're going to be focusing especially on Boethius and Anselm, who believe that God is eternal outside time, but that we have free will, and on Swinburne and Plantinga, who believe that God is sempereternal within time, but also believe that we have free will. Boethius, who lived from 480 to 525 in the medieval period, was part of the Holy Roman Empire and very influential on Christian thought, and even though we've not heard about him very much today. He very much influenced the idea uh, that God is eternal, i.e. timeless, outside time. There is no present, past or future for God. He sees all of them at the same time because he's atemporal. Now that could be read, and we could look at that and think, well, can God then truly have true knowledge? If God, um, can God um, know of the past and the future at the same time? Um, Boethius would answer, yes. Um, God is um, eternal outside the world, but there is an eternal order to things, similar to Aquinas' divine law that we looked at last year. There is an eternal order, and God has set up that order and can see everything at the same time. It's almost like God is in a different dimension um, and can see all events occurring at the same time. This is taken up by Anselm a little bit later. However, um, it does bring up some difficult points. Um, can something truly exist outside time? And this is something that was brought up by uh, Kotobinski, a uh, Polish philosopher. Um, when we think about time, um, we're in this sense, we're treating it as if it is a uh, it's like a linear entity in which things exist. Whereas Kotobinski suggests that time is, uh, is more like a process. Um, time is what happens to objects and what happens to people. And so if there are no objects, there are no people. And therefore, uh, can God really be eternal and outside of time uh, and still exist if time is not happening to it? Um, then there's the question of, can God affect the past or the future? Um, if God is seeing everything at the same time, then surely what's happened in the past won't ever change. But then that raises the question, well, could God change it if he wanted to? Um, or, because he's seeing everything at the same time, does that mean that's exactly what he's done, what he's always done, what he's always going to do, and will never change it, and therefore God can't change the past? And that brings up questions about God's omnipotence, even if it's a bit of a mind-bender. And finally, Einstein's theory of general relativity 
has made us think that actually time is not as straightforward as we thought it was. It is not a simple progression from A to B. Um, it is much more fluid. Um, changes in speed can affect time. So that uh, it doesn't necessarily prove or disprove God. It merely means that we have to think perhaps a bit more differently about time, about rather than just being this uh, entity that goes in a line and that we can be inside or outside of, uh, maybe it's a bit more uh, complicated than this. The problem with Boethius' idea of an eternal God is that if God is eternal, then surely he is at least partly responsible for evil. Basically, if God has got this sort of divine foreknowledge, as it's known, where he can know everything in advance, as opposed to our human knowledge, uh, where we don't know what's going to happen. All of our choices to us appear to be uh, free um, and we don't know what's going to happen. But God does know what's going to happen. Um, then surely if that's the case, he can see exactly what's happened already, knows that evil is going to happen and allows it to be. And this, of course, is very difficult if we're thinking about God's omnibenevolence. It, it works fine for our ideas of uh, omnipotence, and eternity works very well. Uh, the um, Boethius idea of uh, eternal God works very well with uh, omnipotence, and also with omniscience. Uh, but benevolence becomes an issue. Well, Boethius had an answer for this, and some of you might not find it very uh, satisfying, but his answer is this. There are two types of necessity, i.e. what is going to happen. The simple and the conditioned. Now the simple necessity is that whatever happens, these things are going to occur. Um, so for example, all humans will die because we're mortal. There's no way around that. Um, there's, no, there's no middle ground. Certain things have to be the case. A triangle must have three sides. It's um, simple a priori. Conditioned necessity is a priori, but it adds in a or an, an if clause. It is, these things must be true a priori if certain conditions are met. So, for example, if I go for a walk, I will be walking. Um, so, if I'm going for a walk, I must be walking. That is a priori proven it must be the case. But that's only if I'm walking. Or, you know, if I go outside, then I will be outside. So the condition there allows Boethius to say, well, God knows some things will happen, exactly what will happen. But what God also knows is what will happen if certain conditions are met. So we choose the conditions. We make the choices, but God knows the outcomes of all those choices. It's like we're picking a series of railways. Once we're on that railway, we'll get to the end. There's no getting off the rails. But we pick which track to take. And that way, free will can exist even though God is eternal. Now that may not sit well with you. Some philosophers disagree with this as well. Um, but that is Boethius' way around the, the problem of an eternal God and free will. The main problem that comes from this is the idea of a loving God, a loving and just God. If um, God knows everything and all possible outcomes, um, but doesn't necessarily know um, which one is going to be taken, um, then that undermines his ability to be completely just. Uh, if we look back to the last video, thinking about uh, ideas of justice and fairness, um, and particularly philosophers like D.Z. Phillips, who believe God is love, um, feel that this idea of uh, God's eternity undermines some of his other condition, uh, some of his other uh, attributes. Anselm carries on from Boethius' ideas. Uh, Anselm we know from the ontological argument, of course, and he takes what's known as the four-dimensionalist approach. 
Now, for this, you'll have to put aside the idea of time being the fourth dimension. Um, this was created way before that was an idea. So, look at it rather than the four dimensionist approach as a uh, time um, and space being one dimension and this being another dimension on top of it. So, God is eternal, yep, just like Boethius, and impassable. God is unaffected by anything. Now, Anselm uses this to explain that uh, God is outside of time, but he clarifies it further than Boethius and says he's completely external within his own dimension. Uh, but of course this then leaves us with the same problem as um, Boethius in terms of free will and predestination. If God can see uh, everything that's happening at once, then are we predestined um, to whatever happens, and therefore have no free will? Well, Anselm follows on from St. Augustine with the idea that um, freedom is uh, choosing correctly. Now, he's inspired by Augustine's idea that good is an active choice and uh, evil, sin, is the privation of good. So it's no choice at all. It's nothing. There's only good. There's no bad um, as such. Bad comes from the fact that there is nothing there. So we're either in a state of nothing or a state of with God, and that's good. Look back to the St. Augustine uh, predestination and that side um, for a bit of clarification there. Anyway, choosing wrong is basically making no choice. That's the argument here. You are you are not choosing um, wisely. You're not choosing at all. A true choice is a good choice. And so God can choose, but God can only choose good. He's got free will, but he can only choose good because he's the most good. Um, and um, as such, people choose good in order to be like God. Um, and God knows all choices uh, because he's outside of, uh, of time in this other dimension. So he knows everyone's choices. If people don't choose, then they're doing bad. And therefore, God can't know if you're not choosing. So God knows the good because those are the choices. Whereas the bad is the lack of choice. So therefore, free will is allowed um, and God's eternity is allowed. Because God is eternal, God can see all the choices, uh, but we're either choosing or we're not choosing. And that's what making it either good or bad. Now, the problem with this is that because the language of time is not applicable here, God is in his own dimension, we're right on the verge of this becoming meaningless. If we have no reference point whatsoever on this dimension, we're on the verge of losing all meaning whatsoever. And that is a, a, an important criticism of Anselm. Um, it's very well thought out, but uh, and it also you know, gives an eternal God with free will, but it's at risk of losing all meaning. Swinburne and Plantinga take a different approach to uh, both Boethius and Anselm, in that they believe that God is actually with us in time, rather than being eternal. He's in fact semper eternal. He runs with us through time and, is, and uh, travels our journey with us. Swinburne thinks that this um, comes from the Bible. It is unbiblical, in fact, to think of God as eternal. Because an eternal God contradicts the scripture's idea of a personal God who listens to prayers, who um, helps his people along. Um, because if God knew everything at the same time, he wouldn't be able to be there with us to answer our prayers, etc. So Swinburne suggests that actually uh, God isn't eternal, but semper eternal. And that it's a misunderstanding of God's... Um, uh, ever presence to think that he's eternal. He's in fact semper eternal. We therefore make free choices because God is not eternal, he's semper eternal, so there's no predestination. We make our choices and God judges us as we go. Nice and simple. 
Plantinga approaches from a different approach, uh, but he is again arguing God is with us in time. Um, he talks about the idea of God being omnipotent, uh, but also we have radical free will. So God um, is with us as we travel, and we are free to make choices. Uh, this comes from Sartre, who talks about our radical and unpredictable freedom. Um, he, he's an existentialist and believes that we make our own choices, we are radically free, we have nothing constraining us. Uh, Plantinga thinks, uh, yeah, we are radically free, but it's not unpredictable, uh, because uh, we have reasons and we have causes for our actions. Now, a cause would be, uh, the cup smashed because I dropped it. That's a cause. Um, I dropped it uh, because the liquid was hot. That's a cause. A reason is slightly different. Um, I uh, picked up the phone so that I could talk to my friend. These are reasons. And reasons are tied to morality or to good and bad choices. Causes are a bit different. They tend to be cause and effect. But reasons are um, either good or bad choices. And good reasons are good choices. So, um, in our radical freedom, we can, if we travel with God, predictably choose the good. Genuine morality is freely chosen. So the best possible kind of morality is freely chosen. Now, if God is benevolent and all-loving, he's going to want us to have the best form of morality. Which means, he's going to let us make our choices freely, and let us choose good. Because the best good comes from uh, us choosing it. If you're forced to be good, that's really only a pale shadow of being good. But if you choose it yourself, you've thought about it, you've considered it, and you choose good, then it's worth all the evil that's in the world. It's worth the bad choices if you're able to make the good choices. And if you've made bad choices, regret them, repent, ask for forgiveness. That's more loving in Plantinga's argument than forcing us to become robots. That, as far as he's concerned, is not acceptable. Uh, we did cover this in the problem of evil as well, uh, but this is uh, linking particularly to the idea of eternality. God is travelling with us and wants us to make good choices out of our free will. So in this episode we have looked at uh, free will and eternality. We've looked at Boethius and we've looked at Anselm, who suggest that God is eternal, outside time. We've looked at Swinburne and Plantinga, who suggest that God is with us in time, but is semper eternal. And uh, um, we've established that free will exists in all of these cases, according to each of these philosophers. If you've got any questions, of course, let me know. Thanks for watching. See you next time.